It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 680 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. Got an interesting show lined up for you today. My guest is Lee Sauls. Lee is founder and CEO of Sales Architects. He's author of a new book called Sales Differentiation, 19 Powerful Strategies to Win More Deals at Prices You Want. And I should say that as we go to air here with this, is the, his book has become one of the top sellers on Amazon, one of the top selling sales books. So congratulations to Lee on that. It is a worthwhile book. Now, before we get to Lee, I want to talk to you about The Sales House. The Sales House is the B2B sales learning accelerator. Now, here's the thing. Sales is a tough profession, and quite honestly, perhaps the loneliest profession. I mean, your success is largely in your hands. I mean, you're the one out there on the island all by yourself talking to your buyers. I mean, it's all up to you. Well, you don't have to sell alone. That's why I created The Sales House, to provide a welcoming resource for B2B sellers like you to find the knowledge, the wisdom, the advice you need to take charge of your career, to take charge of your success, and to enable you to become the best version of you possible. So if you join the sales house, you get unlimited access to me and every bit of sales wisdom I've acquired from my long and successful career in sales. And you get access to a roster of world-class experts sharing their expertise and as well as unlimited access to our live coaching hours that I host personally every week, live workshops with some of these world-class experts and some of our in-person meetups. So, and maybe on top of it, maybe the thing that's most important is you also get access to a whole community of like-minded sales professionals just like you who are going through the same things you are going through that you can tap for advice. So remember, you don't have to sell alone. Come invest a few minutes a day in the sales house to get just a little bit smarter to be able to help your customers just that much more. Visit thesaleshouse.com forward slash, forward slash accelerate. That is thesaleshouse.com forward slash accelerate to learn about our special $1 trial offer for listeners of Accelerate. Okay, let's jump into it with my guest today, Lee Sauls. Now, we're talking about sales differentiation, meaning how do you stand out in a crowd? My guest, Lee Sauls, has published his latest book, Sales Differentiation, as I mentioned, Amazon bestseller. And we're going to explore some of the 19 strategies he spelled out in his book. Among the topics we're going to discuss is how do you differentiate yourself with meaning? And how do you translate your passion for your differentiators into the buyer's passion for your differentiators? How do you use positioning questions to help buyers think differently about the problems they're trying to solve? And we're going to delve into Lee's five-step process for developing those exact same positioning questions. All right, here we go. Lee Sauls, welcome to the show. Actually, this is your your second, at least your second time, if not your third time. It is, Andy. Thank you. Well, it's nice to have you back again. It's been been too long. Always Always a pleasure. Likewise, always a pleasure. So um, we have you here because you've got a new book you've just published, and it's called Sales Differentiation, 10 Powerful Strategies to Win More. Oh, 19. That's right. I'm sorry. My typo. 19 don't, Powerful don't Strategies. <laughs> don't want to sell you short. Nine. Don't want to sell you short. That's right. It's my typo. Uh, 19 Powerful Strategies to Win More Deals at the Prices You Want. So just briefly, why? Why this book and why now? Well, let me ask you a question. Before before we get into this, how many, sure. how many expert guests do you think you've had on on this show over the years? Well, this is uh, by the time this gets published, we'll be close to yeah. seven hundred episodes. Seven hundred. Mm-hmm. So your viewers are probably wondering why you're even having me on the show. Not to mention a, a second time. So oh no, I'm sure they don't question it at all. Well, <laughs> they trust. Well, they trust my choices. I do, but let me tell them because I'm sure it's a question. So I'm the best sales consultant in the world. The best. That's that's why you're having me back. Or your your look on your face is just priceless. <laughs> well, just cause that's because I know where you're leading with this, but go ahead. Yeah, because you had a chance to have a little sneak peek in my book. I, but I bet you I bet I've your, read your book. <laughs> the listeners, yeah, they're probably saying, What an arrogant jerk. Why do I gotta watch this guy? Well, if you think that about me, here's my question for you. Why do you think your prospects feel any differently about you than you feel about me at this moment when you come marching in saying your company, your products, your services are the best? They don't. They feel the exact same way that you feel about me at this moment. So I, back to the question, though, just because I know where you're going on that. And I, it's yeah. really important. So, so 
you know, this idea is, and what you're doing is, <laughs> is you know, what buyers experience all the time, right? Is salespeople come in, we're the best, right? We're the da 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 da. You know, is is it worse than it ever was, or it's the same? I mean, is it in terms of this ability to, and the necessity to differentiate yourself in a meaningful way? I mean, has it become more acute, or what's going on? Yeah, I, I think it's you know as more technology has come out and information has been put out and making it easier for buyers to evaluate. You know, the way the human mind works is we want to commoditize when we buy. In our mind, we want to put everything in a grid. And some people actually do it on paper. Some do it in our heads. And we say to ourselves, here's our criteria Mm -hmm. and here's where we can get it. And you fill in the boxes and say, now what's the best price for that? And so when buyers do that, and come to the table thinking that this is their criteria and this is the price. If you aren't the low price provider, you lose every time. So I, I think it's gotten much worse, much more challenging for salespeople, and even more important that they learn how to differentiate themselves than ever before. So what you're saying is you think that that given sort of this rapid commoditization that happens. And this, you know, something that we've been seeing as a trend for a number of years now is that, you know, it's hard to maintain any sort of meaningful differentiation with products, so thus price becomes sort of the the base purchase price or base purchase decision point. Um, but again, you think it's becoming more that way now. Well, there's a few things that that you just referenced that we should talk about in that point. Number one, very common that I find salespeople, executives, all the way up through the CEO, so passionate about their differentiators, Mm -hmm. but they don't have a strategy to position them in such a way that the person on the other side of the desk shares that passion. So they come in saying, this is the best and expecting someone to say, wow, I agree with you. What they get in return is a big eye roll. Oh, here we go again. Another salesperson that tells me that they're the best. They don't believe it. And so that 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 point and having a way to position in a compelling way your differentiators, and it's a concept you read about in the book, this idea of positioning questions, mm-hmm. of developing open-ended questions that help buyers think differently about the solutions you have or could have. All right. So well, let's talk about that. Let's dig into that. Because because in that section, you you sort of draw a contrast with sort of the challenger questions that uh, big with the challenger sales. So why don't you walk people through what you, you mean, what the difference is between your positioning question versus a challenge question and what the importance is for sellers. Sure. So when we talk about a positioning question, it's always an open-ended question, which of course, you know, is a a design not to get a yes or no response, Mm -hmm. but it's designed to help someone think differently about the solutions you have or could have. And one of the questions I love to ask salespeople is who knows more about the array of opportunities in your industry, the solutions available, you or the people you sell to? And I've never had a salesperson come to me and say, oh, the people I sell to, they know much more than I do about the world of solutions in my industry. Not one has ever come back to me. Mm-hmm. So you're selling to VPs, directors, CEOs, CFOs, these high-level executives, and we forget that we have an expertise that they don't. Mm-hmm. But these are high-powered executives, and if your approach is to come in and lecture them, you're going to have a really short meeting. Right. right? That's, that's no, not the way they want true. to be. Right. So we need to have a creative way of helping them see that there can be other opportunities. Now, I'll give you an example. I, I live in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And in the state of Minnesota, you contract for your own trash removal. So every Wednesday morning, there's a parade of garbage trucks coming down my street because every neighbor contracts with somebody different for the service. Really? Yep. It's it's a really interesting. I, I never knew that. A, <laughs> so there's no there's no like the city doesn't have a contract with somebody. Wow. Well, okay. 
so about 7 a.m., I guess they all have the same routes. You just see this parade of garbage trucks coming down the street. Each one pulls up to the home, seemingly doing the same thing. The truck pulls up, arm extends, lifts up the can, dumps it into the truck. Can goes down, truck drives away, you get an invoice at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. CEO, one of these companies reached out to me, said, I believe we provide meaningful value. I believe we're different than the competition, but our salespeople really don't know what those differentiators are and how to position them in a compelling way. So they went through this program with me and um, one of the points that came up was they have this service. They're the only ones in the state of Minnesota with this service. It's called the Can Be Clean Truck, where twice a year they clean your garbage cans. They have a truck comes out and cleans them all out. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the smell in your garbage of your garbage in your garage in the summer, right? Nasty. So we developed a positioning question for their residential salespeople. These are people who are making calls, knocking on doors, and the first thing they say after they introduce themselves is a question. When's the last time you had your garbage cans cleaned? Mm-hmm. Because we know they never have, or they did it themselves, which if you've ever done it is a miserable experience. And right in that first moment, we've differentiated ourselves. We've gotten someone to think differently about something as simple as trash. Mm -hmm. Not because of something we said, but rather a question that we asked. Yeah, why isn't someone cleaning my garbage cans? I hate the smell in my garage. And I don't want to do it myself. And so that opens the door to conversation and having them want to be learning more about what you could bring to the table. Yeah, well, I th- and I, but I think the, the key point there, at least for me, and especially in the example you just gave, and I think it's true with the positioning questions as well, which I, th- I think is, is important for our listeners to, to understand is that for me, at least, the value of the positioning question, because it's a technique I've used for a long time, was, is that what I'm doing is I'm changing the way the customer thinks about the problem. Correct. And so it's not reconceptualizing sort of the value you're providing, but it's how do you get people to think differently about the problem you're trying to solve? Because that has a tremendous amount of value for people. Well, let's come back to the point that people don't know how to buy what you're selling. They don't have that expertise. This company is the only one in the state of Minnesota that offers it. So you 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 describe it as a problem. It's really more of an opportunity because you don't even know that this exists. Sure. You just accept, you know, garbage can smell and and I've got to deal with it. (laughs) Right. So so the idea is it's a creative way to introduce them to something that they didn't know. Mm-hmm. could be better, could be different. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, very clever, very clever. Uh, and I presume it's been successful for them. It, it's worked tremendously well. They they were stuck, because you can imagine, someone knocks on your door, wants to talk about trash service, and everyone says, yeah, we're happy with who we're working with. So unless you're offering it at 50% off, which is not the strategy of this company, very difficult to get someone to have a conversation, ultimately make right. a change. Or unless your current contractor is dumping half your trash on your lawn when they're emptying your can or something. So Right, right. Yeah. And so there's a, a five-step process that I teach in the book on how to develop the, the positioning questions. And, and so the first question you have to ask yourself is, why does this particular differentiator matter to a buyer? You have to be able to understand why this would matter to a buyer. And a lot of times I have conversations with salespeople, with executives, and they'll say, this is one of our differentiators. And when I ask them why this matters, they really struggle to articulate why it matters. And then I bring them back and say, so let's talk about this. You've been preaching this differentiator for how long, expecting someone on the other side of the desk to see your vision, to share your passion, yet you can't even articulate why it matters to them. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great way to introduce the exercise. So first we got to understand who would, uh, why it matters. Then not everything matters to everybody. So, you know, you think about in a B2B sale, you might have a technical buyer, an economic buyer, you might have the user. Very, very different conversations need to take place. Some are going to care about some differentiators. Some are going to care about others. But we have to figure out with this particular differentiator, Who's the right audience? Mm-hmm. The third is the right circumstances. When does this matter? So is it 
if they're using a particular provider, if they say they're having this particular challenge or something you observe in the workplace. And then based on those three data points, we then develop this positioning question, this open-ended question that maps back to that differentiator. And then finally, the fifth step is now that the door is open, what information are you going to share relative to that position in question to help reinforce its its message, its mm-hmm. point? So in the case of the garbage company, what'd they do? So they talked about the service that they that they provided, which as soon as they said that they offered the service was, oh my goodness, seriously? I mean, you talk to any husband who gets the honeydew list on mm-hmm. a Saturday, honey, go clean the garbage cans. There's someone else that's going to do this. Oh, my goodness. And they talk about um, the they have a, a freshener that they put in so they even smell nice. It's not just cleaning them. <laughs> just, like, just like the car wash hanging a thing in your rear view. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very interesting. Well, one thing you get into in the book, which which I think is important for people to understand, is, is that uh, differentiators are – a degree of difference as opposed to being uniqueness. And yeah. I think this is something that salespeople sort of founder on oftentimes. They want to know that the value proposition they have is something unique. <laughs> and yes. yeah, unique doesn't really exist much anymore. If it exists, it exists for a short period of time because everything's copied so quickly. So so really you're looking for yeah, it could be small degrees of difference. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be fifty percent better than someone or fifty percent different. That's just you know, beauty in the eye of the beholder. Right. So there's an, I'm 49 years old and there's an expression that predates me of USP unique selling proposition. I don't know where it first came from. And, and that expression, unique selling proposition leads to so much frustration with salespeople because they're looking for this one thing, like the Holy grail. Uh, it reminds me, remember the movie city slickers, these guys mm-hmm. looking for the one thing in life that would matter to them, which in the movie they, they find, but salespeople, often don't because there isn't this one thing that their company possesses. Like in the case of the garbage truck, they do have something that's unique, but guess what? Their competitors could sell around it. Mm -hmm. What their competitors could do is they'll say, you know what? Twice a year, we'll replace your garbage cans. Problem solved. (laughs) Right? They could also say, you know what? We like this idea. We're going to clean garbage cans. It's not like they have this special soap to do it. No. So, Looking for that one thing, I find that salespeople get so frustrated. I I had this experience myself. Uh, I helped to build and sell a company in the employment screening industry, Mm -hmm. drug testing, background screening, and we were acquired by a competitor. So I'm standing in the conference room with the new executives of, of this team, and I said, okay, now that we're all family here, what makes us unique? I gotta know. And this is over 20 years ago, and I'm still waiting for an answer. (laughs) And it wasn't their fault. It was mine. I asked a bad question. I asked what makes us unique, meaning the only one on the planet to possess this. Mm -hmm. What I should have asked is what makes us different. Right. And and if you think of splitting hairs, look up those two words in Webster's. They're not synonyms. Yeah. Well, no, I don't think it's splitting hairs at all. I think it's an important concept for people to really understand is that – a way I phrase it oftentimes working with groups is say, okay, well, so how much did you win your last deal by? And right. they're like, right. well, what do you mean? Yeah, I said, yeah. well, how much were you 1% better, 5% better, 10% better? And it's a question no one can really answer. But the fact is, you know, theoretically and really and realistically, you only have to be 1% better. You only have to do 1% different. Right. And so when we talk about different, what they should be looking for, instead of that one thing, looking for the aggregate story that they can share, again, using positioning questions, not mm-hmm. lecturing, this aggregate story, again, you have to have the right circumstance, the right individual for it to matter so that someone sees this big picture. I, I look at it like a fingerprint. Every company has this opportunity to create a sales differentiation strategy. When you look at your company holistically, you may not have this one little thing that no one else possesses. But when you look at the aggregate story, uh, you start including uh, the languages that you speak in customer service, the hours uh, that you support them, the ways that you support them, the way you can package, the way you can, all of these different ways that you have, and you put it together and you say, 
there is no one else that we compete with that offers this package in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've worked across all different industries. I'm yet to find a company that doesn't have that opportunity. But if you're in that boat and you say, you know what, there is nothing we could put together than that's different than what our competitors do. You have only one choice left. You know what that is? Call on price. Drop your price. That's it. No one is going to pay more for something that is identical to something else. So when we look at this aggregate story that we need to put together, and, and I talk about in the book, this idea of the sales differentiation universe, these categories where you're going to find differentiators that you didn't even think of, you didn't even think to talk about. Uh, I'll give you another example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mentioned I live in Minnesota, right? So we get these awful winters here, and I've got two large dogs that, you know, they do their business in the backyard. And if you think I go outside when it's minus 20 and pick it up, that doesn't happen. Hey, it's your yard. That's right. <laughs> that's your so, prerogative. Exactly. As long as it's not so, my yard, that's fine. So there's this wonderful service. And, and I'm sure it's offered elsewhere, but um, where someone actually comes out and picks up your dog poop. Really? In the winter? Yeah. Um, they'll do it year round. But what I do is I'll pick it up throughout the summer. And then once you hit November, it starts getting a little chilly here. And from <laughs> November to, to March, you just kind of let it go. And then they have this spring cleanup. Hey, I grew up in Wisconsin and with a mom who did not let those things go. <laughs> I was out there every day picking them up. But go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So they'd come out and they do this, this spring cleanup. And I used the same company for years and they come out and it was delightful, but there was always one thing I didn't like about the service. They pick it all up and then they'd leave the garbage bag for me and I'd have to throw it away. So here's how my world's come together. I talked about the garbage cleaning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now I got to take these giant bags of poop, put it in my garbage cans. And you can only imagine as that starts to now you out, want them cleaned. Now I want them cleaned. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so this year, I went to schedule service, and they're really slow to respond. And one of their competitors happened to send me an email. I said, you know what? They didn't respond. Sure. I'll, it's just picking up poop. It's all the same thing. So the guy comes out first time for the service and picks up the poop. And then I see him putting it in his truck. I said, what are you doing? He goes, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm taking the poop away. He goes, you take it away? <laughs> Okay, we've we've just had a podcasting first. I think we just spent <laughs> five minutes talking about dog poop, but no, but absolutely, it's true, right? He just he just did it, and and so later that afternoon, the owner of this you know small company calls me up and see how that first service was, and I said to him, I said, do you compete against this other company? He goes, oh, absolutely. I said, do you know what your differentiator is that really would matter to people compared to him? He goes, no, I don't. I said, you take the poop. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you know, I think I knew about that. I said, you knew about it. I said, that's the conversation your salespeople should be having when you're selling your service, not lecturing people, but asking them a question. So when you have the service perform where someone cleans up the poop, how are you going to discard it? Because most people are going to expect that the service would take it with them, but this other service did not. So, and guess what? Of course, I didn't tell him this. I would have paid more sure. you know, for someone to take that away and me not to have to touch it and deal with it. So a lot of times you find you've got these differentiators that you haven't even thought about and therefore are in positioning. All right. So in the time we have left, I want to get into sort of the, the last chapter of your book. So you know, I'd written about this, this topic of how you sell is more important than what you sell. But really, just from the individual standpoint, uh, with my first book, Zero Time Selling, you're dealing with a whole, you know, your whole entire sales approach. But I did want to get into your last chapter because you do talk about this as as the individual. I guess you call it the the uh, irrefutable differentiator. So let's talk about this concept of personal value differentiation. Sure. So beyond what you sell, I mean, the product, services, technology. And beyond how you sell, which is every interaction you have from the initial contact all the way into contract, customer service, and account management, there's another component to this, which is personal value differentiation. And every salesperson has this opportunity to provide meaningful value beyond what their company brings to bear. Mm -hmm. And there's different ways that can be done. One is to become an expert. 
not you don't have to know how to put the widget together, but to be able to understand the interaction that your company has relative to other aspects of a business. For example, if you're selling printers, that you understand the relationship with toner and you understand mm-hmm. the relationship with paper and what have you. If you're selling cars, that you're looking at the impact of service and oil and gas. And so that you can help counsel people and to make informed buying decisions that they see you as a valuable resource, not just someone that's trying to sell them something. Right. So this gets into, especially in the B2B area, this gets into this idea of, and you sort of, you begin to touch a little bit on it in this chapter, is business acumen, right? Is is phrase we're hearing more and more where if you're really going to become a, an advisor, a trusted advisor to a customer, is that you need to be able to have a little bit broader worldview and perspective in terms of how your solution fits into their business and what it ultimately means for them. And you like you allude to it when you're talking about being upstream, downstream, and impact, impact, excuse me, impacts. Yes. Tongue twister there of the solutions that you sell. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So all things being equal. I mean, there's a lot of things you can buy where the product is identical from one place to another. The Ultimately, it comes down to who the salesperson is, what value this individual brings to bear. And every single salesperson has this opportunity and they haven't necessarily thought about developing themselves as a differentiator and saying, you know what? I'm going to do the following things. I'm going to learn their business. So for example, if you normally sell to CFOs, become an expert on CFOs. What are they concerned about? What's their language? What are they trying to accomplish? So that they see you as an extension of them, someone that can be a resource, someone that can help them in their business, not just pushing a product, service, or technology on them. Tremendously important today. When we look at that that personal value differentiation, there's another part that I talk about, which is being responsive and anticipating needs. Mm Mm-hmm. Another way to describe it is customer service and account management, which are commonly viewed as synonyms. And I draw this distinction that customer service, forget not customer service department, not those people, but the function of customer service, that takes place whenever someone asks you for something. They're asking you to provide them with something. Account management is the proactive service that you provide to a client. Mm-hmm. And a lot of companies haven't defined what account management is. Therefore, it's an opportunity for salespeople to craft account management for their portfolio to say, you know what? Clients are going to call. They're going to need this. They're going to need that. They're going to have this question. But beyond that, here's what I'm going to do to provide meaningful value for my clients beyond what the product brings to bear, whether it be... Uh, providing them not with reports, but analyzing reports and coming in and making recommendations based on what you're seeing, the trends and what have you, keeping them apprised of developments in the industry, <coughs> excuse me, apprised of the industry, new regulations, changes so that they're staying in the forefront. Right, which gets back to this idea sort of the business acumen is, you know, to me, that's, that's right. a, another chapter in that that book, if you will, is that... Yeah, how are you able to act as a strategic advisor, not just a tactical advisor, to your to your customer? So, I guess one of the key questions, I guess, for me about that is, so yeah, if you're going to give a takeaway to people listening to this, individual contributors, how do they develop those capabilities? How do they become an expert at CF? I mean, your recommendations, obviously, in terms of you know, how do they how do they become the expert that can become that? trusted advisor? How do they learn enough about a customer's business to be able to be that upstream, downstream advisor? Well, it it's a lot easier today than it was when you and I got started. I mean, you had this little fad called the internet. So there's so much information at your fingertips where you can get involved in various associations. You don't necessarily have to join them, although that could be helpful as well. But go on the association websites and see what are, what are they preaching to their membership to focus on? What are they concerned about? And develop some expertise there so that, again, you could counsel. So I keep using the CFO example. Mm -hmm. So you get involved with the CFO organization and you see that they're being counseled around a new trend. Learn everything you can about that trend and 
help your CFO clientele address that particular aspect. But it's so easy to get this information online today. You can find out anything. And so often you you hear this conversation of pre-call planning, and it's been preached forever. But salespeople, they don't necessarily take that information and organize it in a way that is going to be beneficial and helpful to those that they're selling to. Yeah, well, I think the for people listening to this again, I, great advice. Like going to a trade association website, I think that's perfect. Or trade association online magazines or virtual uh, physical magazines you can subscribe to. Um, and don't feel like you had, need to have perfect knowledge. You know, I think a lot of people say, "Oh, I need to learn everything." It's like, well, over time, learn everything. <laughs> I mean, you're going to start at one point, and the way you'll learn and sort of embellish the knowledge you have is to talk to prospects, right? They will teach you. I mean, how much how much do we all learn from our prospects? A lot. So I'll go to the other extreme. To your point, you don't need to know everything. Build relationships internally and externally so that you can pull experts forward mm-hmm. to help your clients as needed. Right? Today we talk about someone being an expert in something. Well, they can do that very easily by just sharing content from others. They've never written a darn thing about it. But let's say I'm an expert in baby safety. I, I want to be that. I just keep sharing articles and information relative to baby safety, and I've written none of it. Mm-hmm. It gets seen as a resource. So same concept here is that you don't need to know all of it, but develop these relationships so that you can bring forward expertise as needed. Okay. So last point I want to get into before you go is, is um, you were writing about prospecting in the book. And... And this is sort of a critical thing for initial point of differentiation. As you say, the people know you wrote. Is people no longer tolerate being the sales call of the day, and their expectation is that before you call them, you've done your homework, and you have a reason why they should have a conversation with you. And yet, that part of things hasn't really gotten any better. If you look at the, if you look at the data and the research, and so they still accept the calls, and and we're still making tons of calls, and so especially with the growth of inside sales, if you're an SDR and you've got this task, you know, you've been tasked with this activity metric, you got to make so many calls and outreaches. Right, right. It's a tough position to be in. So, so last, last bit of advice for the interview, how does, how does an SDR differentiate themselves? So when we talk about that initial call, I, I use this metaphor around a crime theory. And I talk about this in the book. Imagine mm-hmm. it's two in the morning and there's a pounding on your door and it's the police and they want to have a conversation with you about a crime that just been committed. We well, didn't randomly pick you for a conversation. They followed a trail of evidence. That trail of evidence has led them to put together this crime theory that points to you for a conversation right now. So you can kind of guess where I'm going relative mm-hmm. to sales. Well, spell it out for us. Right. So the idea is that you search for evidence, things that are going on inside a company. Maybe they have a new initiative, a new trend. Um, Their competitors doing something that they're not, a new best practice in their industry. You search for that type of information, and then there's purpose to your outreach. So instead of someone feeling like they're the prospecting call of the moment, almost like they're in a queue, that you're reaching out to them and saying, hey, Competitor A, B, and C is offering this this new service that's going gangbusters, and I noticed you're not offering that, and this is something that we help companies put into place. Now, it's a very different initial interaction than, hey, yeah, we sell this service, and I understand you're the one that buys it, and therefore, I'm calling you. <laughs> well, yeah, which, I mean, all makes sense. I think, I think the challenge SDRs have in a lot of inside sales environments is... Yeah, they're so overwhelmed by the demands of what they need to do and the quantity of things they have to do that, yeah, that research required to develop the the theory of the crime, so to speak, sort of in short supply. So that's why I started saying is in that type of environment where there's you know, overwhelming pressures from multiple directions, how do they? You know, we have this whole idea of personalization at scale, which is a complete oxymoron. Um, how? Yeah, the individual is all important. This first interaction is so crucial for Absolutely. for them. Yeah, what what do they do? Well, what's been preached to them again predates you and me is that sales is a numbers game. Hey, hey, I'm a young man. Careful. 
all right, I'm 49. I don't know what you want to call me. <laughs> um, and it's a numbers game. And that's partially true. You certainly have to have quantity in the outbound effort for prospecting. But what's not measured enough is the qualitative side of it. Mm-hmm. I would much rather have a sales rep that makes five really strong connections than someone that makes 25 and doesn't get any appointments because they're making people feel like the call of the moment. Mm-hmm. So to take a little bit, it doesn't take long to put together this sales crime theory. If you know what evidence you're looking for, you say, for example, if you help companies that have recently launched a new product and you have a particular area, so you do some research around new product releases and you focus on those companies and now you have purpose to the call. I noticed Mm -hmm. you just released this new product. We help them with packaging, blah, 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 blah. And so it's an opportunity that you have and it doesn't take a lot of work to be able to do it. But that 60 seconds to two minutes that it takes to do that that bit of research, put that sales crime theory together, turns those calls from just being a numbers game. And quite frankly, makes it a lot more fun when you're trying to solve a mystery. It's your own version of Scooby-Doo, right? Where instead of just saying, I'm going to make a random call, say, I'm going to look for the reason. And this is the, the core point of that sales crime theory, to figure out why they should want to talk with me right now. Not why I should call them, why they should want to talk with me right now. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking to find when I look for sales crime theory evidence. Excellent. All right, well, Lee, we could go on forever, but we have to call a close. So uh, tell people about your new book and where they can find it, where they can get in contact with you. Great. So uh, sales differentiation is available on Amazon. It's available in hardcover, Kindle, audiobook and mp3 and it's 19 powerful strategies just not 10 as i shortcut you in the beginning yeah you cut my book in half yeah <laughs> can you buy it half <laughs> you cannot buy it in half no uh, and every one of them uh, is told with lots and lots of stories as you read andy mm-hmm. Um, it is not a dry sales book. If you're a business owner and you're not necessarily uh, used to being in a sales environment, you're going to understand every aspect of this book. If you're an advanced 25-year salesperson, I guarantee you're going to take ideas and concepts from this book that you're going to be able to put into practice. Um, more than welcome to reach out to me through my website, Sales Architects, and that's plural, architects.com. Excellent. All right, Lee, thank you very much. Andy, always a pleasure. Great fun. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for this week. First of all, I want to thank you for joining me. And I want to thank my guest, Lee Sauls. Join me again next week as I welcome PJ Bouton, founder and CEO of Showpad, to the show. We're going to be talking about sales enablement. So be sure to join us. And before you go, don't forget to check out the Sales House, the all-in-one sales learning accelerator for B2B sellers just like you. Visit thesaleshouse.com forward slash accelerate, or you can go to andypaul.com. Either way, we'll get you to the sales house. We'll see you there. And thanks again for joining me. Until next week, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone.